So I'll just run you through the typical process uh, of a production going through provisional and final. Um, obviously you start with your script, you've got a development phase, you might get a bit of funding from the government for development or it's privately funded and then you know the producer comes on board and basically puts together a finance plan um, which will generally include uh, the producer offset as part of the finance plan. Uh, now quite often the producer will cash flow that producer's offset because the producer's offset doesn't actually come till the very end of the, end of the process after the produ production is completed and you've done your Screen Australia application and your tax return but the production actually needs the money during the shoot they'll quite often borrow against that producer's tax offset. And that's, that's why the provisional certificate is really important. So a provisional certificate, I sort of think of it as like a pre-approval for, for a loan on a mortgage or something like that. You're basically going into Screen Australia and saying, if I shoot this production with this budget and with this people attached, would I qualify for the, you know, for example, for the 40% of the feature film with this distributor attached, this marketing plan and that sort of thing. So Screen Australia then look at everything and go, Yes, if you shoot that film, you would qualify and you get a provisional certificate and then you can actually go to a lender like a fulcrum or a headgear and go, here's my provisional certificate, it's all been signed off by Screen Australia, um, can you then lend me some money against that provisional certificate, knowing that you know, in 18 months I will be getting a you know, tax refund of $2 million, uh, can you lend me $1.8 million against that? And that's, that's what fulcrum and headgear sort of do. Some productions... Uh, won't have a distributor attached and, and they'll actually go to prove their intent to distribute theatrically by actually waiting till they've made the film, distributing it and then going into Screen Australia and going, here's how I proved my intent to distribute theatrically. I did distribute it theatrically. Here's my box office records. Uh, here, here's where I distributed. Um, and so, you know, please qualify me for the 40% on that basis. If you did that and you screened once at Dendi in the Opera Keys, you're probably going to struggle to actually prove your intent to distribute theatrically. There's no hard and fast rule as to how wide the distribution needs to be. And Screen Australia will say, you know, they judge every case on their merits. But basically, if you can release in uh, three capital cities with a run of one to two weeks, uh, you can be reasonably confident you're going to qualify for the intent to distribute theatrically. So that's if you don't get the provisional, because you don't have a distributor attached, but then do distribute theatrically and go in at final. Um, that's sort of how, how that will always work. During the shoot, uh, quite often the accountants will track the quape to see where, to, to make sure that all the quapes are aligned in accordance with the, the budget. Um, and there you're tracking things like, are you buying a lot of things from overseas and maybe they're on quape and maybe you need to look at, at you know, having a word to your art department and buying some more things locally, that sort of thing. And then you go into post-production. Um, I'm going to mention something here which the industry calls reinvestment. Uh, personally, I, I don't like that term reinvestment, but it's the one the industry uses. Uh, and that's where, say for example, you've got a producer who's getting a fee of 100000 um, They will say, I will reinvest 50% of my fee back into the production. So what you really you've got, you've actually got two separate transactions. You've got the producer being paid a fee of $100,000 and then as an investor paying the, into the production $50,000. So the net payment to the producer is $50,000, but you really have two separate transactions. He's getting $100,000 and then putting $50,000 back into the production. Uh, and that, that very often forms part of the finance plan where your producer, your director, your writer, your DOP, your production designer quite often um, will reinvest part of their fees to help the production get up and get financed. Um, a big contributor for that is quite often the post-production house. There are tax implications around that whole transaction um, because uh, obviously when, it, when a producer gets paid 100000 that's income for them. But when they go to invest that 50000 there isn't a tax deduction for investment in the film per se. So they don't get an automatic tax deduction for that 50000 uh, What a lot of productions will actually do is as part of that investment agreement, they'll actually assign some copyright to the producer in this case. Um, it might be like, you know, 1% copyright. But that, that investment actually creates what's called an intangible asset for tax purposes. 
and you can write an intangible asset off over its effective useful life. So that 50,000 investment by the producer, they might be able to write that off over five years, for example, if the film's going to be generating income for five years. So over five years, they'll get a tax deduction of 50,000, uh, which means over time, OK, they've had income of 100,000, 50,000 of it's the net cash. They've got a deduction of 50,000 over five years. So it does tax equalise over time. But um, in the short term, that can create tax issues for the producer. I mean, obviously, if the producer's in a, you know, got a company he's going through and that company has tax losses, then it's not going to worry the producer. So you don't actually know the tax position of the investors, but quite often the inv investors are looking for some sort of tax deduction uh, when they're investing in a film, and copyright's one way of doing it. Delivery, uh, obviously, once you finish post, you're delivering the film. Once the film is delivered, um, as the accountant, we sort of really start getting busy again. So during post, obviously, you know, we're involved in maybe paying invoices or doing cost reports, that sort of thing. But once the film is delivered, that's pretty much a... Well, delivery is actually defined as the film is ready to be delivered. So you may not have actually physically handed the copy to the distributor. Um, but once the film is completed, and that's noted by a tech check document by the post house generally, then that's sort of the lock-off date for... Uh, you know, for incurring expenses and expenses after that date are subject to a high level of scrutiny. From there, as an accountant, I would say it would generally take four, around four weeks to um, get the project to Screen Australia. So you've generally got a week or two making sure you've got all your invoices in, um, finalising the general ledger. Uh, you're then going out to audit for one or two weeks, uh, preparing quape spreadsheets, that sort of thing. So, so generally it takes about four weeks from delivery to getting something to Screen Australia. Now that's best case, sometimes it takes quite a lot longer, sometimes the producer's still chasing invoices six, 12 months later, like sometimes there are, there are significant delays, but generally you can get it done in about four weeks. Screen Australia will then take about 12 weeks to review the project. Uh, they will generally look at the project as submitted initially, and if you're missing anything major, they'll come back and go, oh, you haven't submitted a producer's contract or you haven't submitted a distribution agreement. So they'll just go through and do a very high level check and if you're missing something they'll let you know. It pretty much then goes on a board and sits on the bottom of a board for four or five weeks and then you get allocated an assessor. They'll check with the assessor to make sure it's not somebody you've you know, worked with or not in the past, that sort of thing. They'll come back and ask questions about, about various items. I mean, I think they've got like a 10 page checklist that they go through. Um, there's often a little bit of negotiation or, or they might pick up something, something small in most cases. Roughly at the end of the 12 weeks they'll come back and you'll get your letter from Screen Australia which will confirm the quape, the quape expenses. At that stage, uh, if you're past the end of the tax year, you'll put in a tax return. Uh, and the tax returns are actually coming back fairly quickly, two to four weeks, but a lot of them are coming back in two weeks these days because Screen Australia are actually notifying the ATO when they issue a one of these, uh, a quape letter, uh, a final certificate. So the ta ATO has sort of now got a lot better about processing them fairly quickly. Just talking about timing tax return, which David sort of referred to, your application for refund goes into the year that you delivered the film. So if you delivered the film on the 28th of June, it will go into your 30 June tax return. If you deliver the film on the 2nd of July, then it would actually go into the tax return for next year, which is you know, almost 12 months away. Which is why there's a couple of alternatives, one of which is liquidating the company, and when you liquidate the company, you do a final tax return and you claim your producer's offset through that. And the other one, which David also mentioned, was you can actually look at doing a substitute accounting period, and I'll touch on that a bit later, where you basically don't have a 30 June financial period end for tax. You actually look at when you think you're going to deliver it and, and change your, your accounting period for that with the ATO.